Welcome to WOJC Ministries. It is November the 27th, 2018. And we are now into week 5 into the book of Revelation. And today we're going to finish out chapter 1. Yay! We're going to go through uh, verses 12b through 20. So I'm just going to jump in by reading where we left off last video and finish out the chapter. Revelation 1 verse 12 through 20. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were like wool, white wool, as white as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those things that are, and those that are to take place after this. As far as the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Last video we discussed John turning to see this voice that spoke to him and I had asked the question whether or not we're willing to stop, turn, and listen to the voice of the Lord in our own lives. And I said many, many times that everything with God can be related back to us somehow. If your spouse is talking to you, do you not take the time to stop, turn, and speak to them? And I believe that God speaks to us all of the time, but we just don't take the time to listen. So. John saw these seven golden can candlesticks, and this is the first thing he sees. And in order to fully understand the meaning behind the candlesticks themselves, again, let's go back to the Old Testament. I believe that once you hear and see the Old Testament background, the scriptures are going to be a lot more clear. Listen to what Revelation tells us about this, the seven candlesticks. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. So we see that the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches that John is writing to in Asia. And there is further significance from the Old Testament. The roots of the seven candlesticks go all the way back to Exodus, where Moses was told to make a seven-branched candlestick out of pure gold. Exodus chapter 25 and 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And notice that this candlestick was beaten work. I think it's important to know that uh, this candlestick in Exodus was made as a one piece and not seven individual pieces. So the gold would have to be hammered and molded into shape, a beaten work. And I do not believe that it, that's by chance that it was coincidental that the candlestick was in one piece molded and hammered into shape into the, in, so it would be formed. Sometimes we as children of God have to be molded and shaped and hammered into form as we live in this life. Sometimes we need to be broken. We need to come to a point in our lives where we understand that everything that goes on is for our benefit and for shaping our lives into what God wants our lives to be. Now we also find out from the Old Testament that the candlestick is the only source of light that's in the tabernacle. When you walk into the holy place, there is only one light source in there, this golden candlestick. And we relate this to what Jesus Christ himself said, John 8:12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then what does Jesus say about the church, right? You are the light of the world. So in order to be light, we have to be hammered or broken. And brokenness is not fun. 
but God uses it so that we can bear that light. I want you to know that if you're being broken tonight, that you can have peace in knowing that God loves you enough to break you. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. God is doing this because you need it. Just remember that all things work out for the good that love him, right? Praise God. So John sees uh, seven of these candlesticks. And in the tabernacle, Moses is only asked to make one, not seven. So I personally think this portrays the nation of Israel in comparison to the seven churches in Asia. The nation of Israel is literally one nation as there were seven churches in Asia. Each church is independently responsible to the Lord. We are one body, but it's not like we're all one nation like Israel was. Israel has one nation that was singularly set apart for the Lord, but the churches are in all different countries. Although we're one body, we function independently, and we are all independently responsible to God for who we are. So I believe John sees these seven, seven candlesticks to represent this. So what else do we see about the candlesticks? Uh, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 2. And said unto me, What do you see? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold, which a, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. So first we see that there were seven lamp steps, seven lamps on the candlestick. And in verse 10, Zechariah 4.10, For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout all the earth. So we see here that uh, the candlestick had seven lamps. And in verse 10 we see it says, And shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven lamps. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So with all this being said and all the background information on the candlesticks, the Lord tells John to write what he sees. The seven golden candlesticks are symbolic of the seven churches that he's writing these letters to. And when you relate it back to Zechariah 4.10, these lamps are the eyes of the Lord. Then you can put it all together. The churches are the eyes of the Lord. And we're meant to look upon injustice in the world and make it right. We are meant to see as God sees. There is too much of the church being conformed to what the world sees. And there are not enough of the churches being conformed to what God sees. Do we as individuals see the world as God sees the world? Do we conform our hearts to God's heart? In every aspect of our life, we need to see as the Lord sees. We need to have the eyes of the church to be God's eyes and not the world's eyes. These seven churches are the seven candlesticks being light bearers. And are we bearing light in this world? Is the church a light in the world? The church has lost its light in this world. And Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. And if you link your lights up with me, you will be light as well. Jesus is the greater light, the son of God. And we get this concept all the way back in Genesis where, where the day and night were separated. The sun was the greater light, while the moon was the reflection of the light of the world. And what happens to the light when the sun or the moon does not shine? The world gets in the way, right? And that's what has happened to our churches. The world has gotten in the way and the light has become less great. Are we adequately shining in the world? We are called to be the light of the world. Now on a cloudy day, it's the world getting in the way of the light, right? And that's exactly what is going on in the churches today and in our own lives. And we're going to see this when we get to the seven letters of the, of the churches. We need to remove the world from our lives so that the light of the Lord can clearly shine in us to a lost and dying world. So as you can see, God specifically uses the lampstands or the candlesticks to show us much more than them just being something that holds a candle or oil. When the Bible says something, we need to understand that there is much more there. And the only way that we can get a full, complete understanding of this is to study for ourselves 
and to find that gold nugget that God has for us. Amen. Okay, moving on. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So the first thing important is um, when it says one like unto the Son of Man, this is a bad translation. It really, in the Greek, is one like a Son of Man. So this is definitely Jesus who we're seeing. The translators put it like unto the Son of Man, which does not give a complete understanding that it's not about being like the Son of Man, but being a Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And I think this is important because Christ calls himself the Son of Man all throughout his ministry. Not one like a Son of Man, but a Son of Man. All the translations that, that were written on the Dead Sea Scrolls, they used the A Son of Man as well, as it should be translated. Now, the Son of Man, it means, um, it com well, it comes from the Hebrew, and it means the Son of Adam. Uh, the Hebrew word is Adam, which is Strong's H120, which means man. It was later written in the Greek for the New Testament, and Adam is translated to man. Jesus, as the Son of God, is divine and without sin. As the Son of Man, he was begotten of Mary in the line from David, Abraham, and Adam. And this was Jesus' favorite title for himself. Remember, God came to the earth so that he could save us from our sins, but he also had to relate to us. When Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he's saying, I am human. I will suffer as my creation suffered. I will bear the suffering and sin in my body for my creation. I have always been and I am a descendant from Adam. Really, the whole section comes out of the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw a in the night vision, and behold, one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So when John says, I see seven candlesticks, and in the midst of them there is one like a son of man, it relates back to Jesus Christ. There is one like a son of man. Jesus is in the midst of this light. Jesus is this, the source of this light. And the churches, Jesus is in the midst of the church, right? The, and the churches are to bear light. Listen to how it goes on. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like a unto the Son of Man, one like a Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. This is the priestly garments. The garments down to the feet and gird about the chest. It's the priestly garment. So let's kind of uh, go back to the Old Testament so we can kind of understand this. Uh, we get it out of Exodus chapter 28, verses 2 through 4. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod, or known as a shoulder piece, and a robe, an embroidered coat, a mitre, which is uh, their tiara or hat, and a girdle. And they shall make the holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Holy garments for glory and for beauty. Who is the great high priest? Right? Amen. Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews chapter 7. A priest forever. So he is wearing this priestly garment. Now the priests in the Old Testament were the only people who could tend to the candlestick. They would trim the candlesticks. They would remove the wicks. They would take out the old oil, renewing it with fresh oil. You see where this is going? Uh, they would relight those that went out. <laughs> Praise God. So seeing Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks, he is the priest of the candlesticks, better signify as the priest of the churches. 
And you're going to see in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 how he commends, corrects, exhorts, and warns the seven churches so that they too would bear light. In the Old Testament, it's a revelation of what Christ does for his church today. Like the priest trimming the wicks or filling with oil, sometimes God has to do some cutting and trimming on us. He removes the old oil and puts in new oil. Sometimes he has, a, has to relight our fires if they start going out, right? This whole section here is all about a picture of the priestly role of Jesus Christ as Lord and priest to his children. And when you see the Old Testament background of all this, it should really open your eyes up to see and understand the role of Christ in our lives and the role of Christ in our churches. Now, he has the garment down to his feet. Now, girded about his chest was a golden band, which was a mark of dignity with the high priest. Most wore the band uh, way low on their bodies, but the high priest wore them up as a mark of dignity. So we see Jesus Christ here in his priestly role. We can relate this back to Isaiah chapter 11, 15, or 11, 5, sorry. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So we've, we, have, we have seven candlesticks, and Jesus glorified there in his priestly garments with the band around his chest to note in dignity. And then we have seven attributes of the glorified Christ from here. The attributes of the Father are also the attributes of the Son. And those attributes will all relate to the Father, but they're also attributes of the Son, because the Son and the Father are one. It says that the head of every woman is the man, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of Christ is who? God. God is giving all his attributes to his Son, and we as the body of Jesus Christ should be receiving all of the attributes of Christ. And what's interesting is that these seven attributes are described in body parts as well. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow. Now in eastern countries, light hair commands respect and indicates wisdom of years. Proverbs 16, 31, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Now in our culture, we don't exalt the elderly for their wisdom. They become a hassle to our families, and people stick them in nursing homes and such. But in other cultures, the elderly are revered. They are taken care of. We do not exalt the elderly in this country. And there is no doubt in Jewish culture the elderly were revered. And I personally think that this wool and snow implies purity. So when you see all this, uh, all these things like wool and like snow, I think it relates to one verse in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your skins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So in this very verse, he's talking about our sins being forgiven, but they're related. When our sins are forgiven, what do they become? Pure. I really believe that the concept of the head and the hair being white like wool and like snow no doubt is talking about the purity of Christ. Christ had to be perfect and sinless in order to do what he did. This whole vision is about the glorified Christ as well. So what we are seeing is Christ in his priestly garment and in his purity. And this whole section is all about Christ in his glory. Okay? So his head and hairs were white like wool white as snow and his eyes were as a flaming fire eyes were like a flame of fire and there are references to this in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 6 and in Revelations 19 and verse 12 and Daniel chapter 10 and verse 6 his body also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude and then in 1912 of Revelation uh, when Jesus returns it says his eyes were as a flame of fire so no doubt this is a metaphor for his all piercing knowing deity and his insight into all things his omnipresence and omnipotence other characteristics of the glorified Jesus and that's what we're talking about. 
Uh, Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he? God sees everything. His eyes are like fire, and all of our works will be tried with fire, it says. He sees it all. Why we are doing what we're doing, how we are doing what we're doing, and are we doing it in his strength or our own strength, for his reasons or our own reasons, for his purpose or our own purpose. God's eyes sees everything in our lives. It's the bright, sharp, penetrating eyes that knows and sees all things. So we talked about how the church is um, a light that is meant to be the eyes of God in the world. So do we seek God for insight into the hearts of other people? Do we ask God what sees, what he sees? What do you see when you see this person? How can we talk? talk and help this person his eyes see everything jesus sees everything the whole thing and do we try and see others with the eyes of god or do we just point fingers and condemn them because of their actions we don't usually know why people do what they do unless we know their background and there should be much more long suffering and compassion for these people who do not know the lord and then maybe just maybe we could reach out and understand them more being a friend to them and ultimately leading them into the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we have the head and the hairs like wool and snow, purity. His eyes like the flame of fire, all knowing, all piercing. And then at verse 15, keep in mind this is all about the glorified Christ. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. Now, it is a fine brass or glowing brass as they're fined in a furnace. And most people will say that it speaks of judgment because the brazen altar and the brass items were all, always in the Old Testament as being connected with judgment of the unrighteousness. The sin offering in Exodus chapter 38 and other places. But I believe this it has a deeper meaning than that. Listen to Daniel chapter 3 and 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So when you think of feet or fine brass as refined in a fire, you think of the deliverance for the righteous as those three that were delivered from the fiery furnace. At least I do. I believe that this is the main Old Testament verse for what John is seeing here. When the emperor had them go into the fire, the only thing they, they lost were the chains that bound them. None of their hair was singed or anything except the chains that had bound them. This denotes stability and strength. Christ bearing up and supporting his people in the care and defense of them. That is why God uses the refiner's fire, the furnace, to remove your life, that which binds you, which only God can do. And what happens when you heat silver up to a certain temperature? All of the impurities rise to the surface so they can be removed. They can be scraped off to make pure silver. And sometimes we need our impurities to come forth so that they, they can be dealt with. And this also reminds me of the footprints in the sand. That painting. How many? I guess many have seen the painting. It reminds me of the, that Christ is the one carrying us in the midst of our fiery furnace in everyday life. No matter what you're going through, that's just it. You're going through it. You will break through and come out with more faith and more love for Jesus Christ. Okay, so in his feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Uh, this is a direct reference to the voice of God out of the prophecies of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 24, And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 2, And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. So many waters.
And what do you think about when you hear many waters? To me, I think uh, power. I mean, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, the intensity of that water is very powerful. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Extremely powerful. Okay? In verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. So it should be in the present tense here as well. Having, having in his right hand seven stars. Uh, we don't have to go that far to find out what is what this is because we've already read about it in verse 20 where it says the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches or the messengers to the seven churches. Now the right hand is an area of safekeeping and these messengers of the church called angels or messengers, they are under God's safekeeping and protection. So first we, we see the stars that are messengers. The messengers are in his right hand and now let's put it in reference for today. Who are the messengers of the church today? We are. And what does the word say about us? John 10, 28, and I, give un and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus has the messengers in his hand for safekeeping. No one can snatch you out of the hands of Christ if you are his. And this idea of the stars being the messengers, there's an Old Testament reference to that as well. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. And they had, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So it's the concept that those who are righteous are like stars. And so we have uh, seven stars in his right hand, and then it says... Um, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So what's the first thing you think about? Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We also have this in Ephesians 6.17, and uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it's interesting about these swords in these uh, different scriptures. Uh, notice the Greek word used for sword in the book of Hebrews. And the Greek word used for sword in the book of Ephesians. And compare it to the word sword being used here in Revelation. I love this. God's Word is amazing. It's interesting that the Greek word used in Hebrews and Ephesians denotes a little knife. But the Greek word in Revelation denotes a huge sword, like a cutlass, like a fighting, a warrior sword. Let's look at it. The Greek word is makaria, which is Strong's 3162. That means a knife in Hebrews and Ephesians. Uh, it would be a small knife, just what it says, a knife. And when I think about the scripture in Hebrews and Ephesians, I really think of a scalpel, something so small that it specifically cuts away the little bits that need to be removed, right? As it talks about it uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit into joints and marrow, you would use a scalpel to get into the joints and marrow, right? And um, that's, that's what I look at, a scalpel. But in Revelation, we have the word for sword as well. And it's the same word sword in our English, but a different Greek word used, which is rompaya. Rompaya. It's the Strong's um, 4501. It means a cutlass. It's a cutlass. It's a long sword. This is not a little knife or a small sword. It denotes a huge sword used for weapons during battle. So the importance here is that in Revelation, this sword denotes judgment. It is a straight-up killing sword, a heavy instrument of judgment. What is Christ coming back as? A judge. Now, we're going to read about it in Revelation. That judgment is going to be devastating. And I think God gave John this vision so that we could see who he's coming back at in the clouds, how he's coming and what he looks like. He's coming with a sword to wipe out his enemies. And this should give us comfort knowing that we're not going to have to suffer by that sword when that time comes. Praise God. 
The sword is going to be used in judgment of the wicked who are in a Christ-rejecting world. Now, the Old Testament uh, reference is Isaiah 11, 4. But with the righteous shall he judge the poor, and reprove with an equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Also, Isaiah chapter 49, 1 and 2. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, has he made mention of my name. And he, sh he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He has hid me, and made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hid me. And this is, this is still a reference to the word of God here, and the glorified God. But in the book of Revelation, Christ is coming back to judge. Right now, the word of God is being used to pierce hearts, right? To separate to the division of soul and spirit, the joints and narrow, to discern the thoughts, the makuria or materia cord, sword, like a scalpel. But as we see, once we get into Revelation chapter 6, it's all about judgment. And this is why I believe that Revelation 1.6 has a different word in the Greek than Hebrews and Ephesians, because the time for piercing and discerning the thoughts of the heart and the such is over at the time of judgment. At the time of the return of Christ, it's over. At that point, it's going to be devastating judgment in this world. Okay, and the last part of verse 16. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Uh, this is almost an exact, uh, exact example of Judges chapter 5, 31. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goes forth in his might. And the land had rest forty years. Um, they're speaking of the victorious Israelite warriors in the book of Judges. You have this concept of them being like the sun as its full strength. So Jesus' countenance is like this. It's fully light. No doubt this is a reference of what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration when his face shone like the sun. The countenance of Christ like the sun in its peak of the day now the question is are is our countenance radiant because we've been around and we've been looking at the face of the radiant christ remember when moses when he came down from the mountain his face had shown the glory of the living god because he was with him and do we have this shine upon our faces because we spend time with jesus i, I have actually seen people that i knew I knew they were Christians based upon the glow on their countenance. And I don't know if anyone else has ever seen it, but I, I have seen it. And I believe the more and more time you spend in the presence of God, the more shine you're going to have upon your countenance, just as Moses did. So I'm going to put all this together and uh, reread it with the unveiling that we have uh, listened to. I'm not rewriting scripture. This is just my interpretation of it from my understanding of the word. So I'm going to reword uh, verses 12 through 16. And this is what we're seeing so far. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, which are the seven churches that are to shine into the world. And in the middle of the seven candlesticks or churches, there was one like a son of man, clothed in his priestly garment down to the foot, and girt about the chest with a golden band with dignity. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow in purity, as he washed as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, seeing all and nothing being hid from them. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, denoting stability and strength in the deliverance of his churches and his people, and his voice as the sound of many waters with great and mighty power. And he had in his right hand seven stars, which are the messengers, the bishops, or local pastors of the seven churches, and his children, which could never be plucked out of his hand. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, devastating judgment. And his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength, shining bright as in the peak of day, radiant to all of the earth. Praise God. This is the glorified King of Kings and the glorified Lord of Lords that John is unveiling in his writings here. This is who Jesus is. And do we see him this way? 
do we truly see our Lord this magnificently. This is an awesome portrayal of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. And this is nothing compared to his true glory, which we will someday, if we know him, will see. Amen. And now to the end of the chapter, 17 through 20. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou seest, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. So we see really four parts to this revelation so far. What we're seeing first is that the prophet observes a vision. Then he falls on his face in fear. Then the prophet is strengthened by whoever is showing him this vision. And then finally, the prophet will receive further revelation. And when you go back to back and read Daniel, you see the very same thing going on in Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 10. The prophet sees a vision falling on his face in fear. He being comforted or strengthened by either an angel or in this case, Christ himself. And once he was strengthened, he receives further instruction. Amen. God wants to give us a vision. That's, that's what Joel chapter 2 states. And that's what Peter says on the day of Pentecost. What happens is that the Lord will give you visions and it will humble you. And then he will come, strengthen you, and he'll give you more. Do not be content with where you are today. He wants to teach us. He wants to humble us. He wants to strengthen us. And he wants to give us more. Christianity is about receiving more of God each day, every day. Give us this day our daily bread. Not that you can get any more of God, but we can get more personal with our God. Each day, every day. Okay? Praise God. So, Okay, so let's break down the last few scriptures. Uh, John, I fell at his feet as dead. Um, the way we respond when we see Jesus or come into his presence of Jesus Christ should be in worship, right? We should fall at his feet. You find this with Abraham in Genesis 17.3, Noah in Judges 13.20, Ezekiel in Numbers 3.23, and Daniel in chapter 8 and chapter 10. The same thing happened to the disciple at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. Every example in scripture where someone comes face to face with the glory of God, either they immediately fall down and worship him or they become so aware of their sin that they feared him. When sinful man gets in the presence of a holy, righteous God, God is exalted and they are humbled. And this is the key to humility. And we need to see Jesus. God wants us to see him. John sees Jesus Christ glorified and he falls on his feet as dead and we have this teaching today that God is our genie on call we do not fear the Lord anymore we want God to do everything for us we fear policemen we fl we fear the authorities if we're going 50 miles an hour and see them stoplights right see them headlights <laughs> them them flashy lights but we've lost our fear of God a lack of fear for God is the characteristics of being his enemy Psalm 36 1 transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes I'm gonna say that again the transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes listen to Jeremiah chapter 2 and 19 thy own wickedness shall correct thee and thy backsliding shall reprove thee know therefore and see that is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in you says the Lord God of hosts so many of us do not have the slightest notion or appreciation of our holy, blameless, glorious, heavenly Father. It is a fearful thing to fall into his hands. This hyper-grace living in our world today, I believe it is a doctrine of hell that tramples the precious blood of Christ underfoot. Many walk around and say they're saved, but that's the end of it. I mean, Christ did say it was finished, didn't he? So if it's finished, then I just believe in him. 
and I can still live my life of sin, not worrying about hell. I have uh, I have a get out of jail free card. Yep, I can live in sin. I can live like the devil. I got a get out of jail free card. So many have no fear or reverence for God today. I know the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear, but that does not mean the fear of the Lord. We should fear the one that made us from the dust of the earth. We should honor and respect him and love him by living our lives as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. And I'm sad to say that many who claim to be a child of his will stand in on that day and hear, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. No change in their lives or in their hearts. All right, let's look what happens next. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me. <laughs> Amen. The point of contact with Jesus. How many examples in scriptures are there for this? The leper, the woman with the blood of issue, the point of contact. When I pray for someone, what do you do? You lay hands on them, a point of contact. When we worship Jesus, he touches us. Praise God is all it takes. Amen. So he takes out his right hand and puts it on John. And he says, fear not, I am the first and the last. Don't be afraid, John. And Jesus spoke this all the time. Matthew 14, 27 on the Mount of Transfiguration. I believe that John understood this because um, in John John's first epistle, chapter 418, it says, um, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So God wants us to take all fear out of us by letting us experience his love. Amen. If you're a child of God, a worshiper of Jesus Christ, a worshiper of Yeshua, and you let him touch you, there's nothing to fear. There's no fear. Don't fear because Christ will never leave you or forsake you. Don't fear because no one can take you out of his hand. Amen. Praise God. Now from here, there are uh, two more I am statements and one thing that Jesus has. 17 and 18, when I saw him, fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. So I am the first and the last. And we've looked at that in previous videos. In uh, chapter chapter 1, it comes from three places in the Old Testament. And all of these speak about God the Father. Isaiah 41, 4, 44, 6, and 48, 12. Now, it's very interesting to notice in the scriptures that this concept of being the first and the last is linked with the concept of people fearing in all three cases. Right? Isaiah 41, 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord am the first and the last, I am he. Now, the, the context of this contains a picture of God's servants defeating the enemy with a sword in Isaiah 41, 2. And the key phrase of do not fear is immediately followed by divine words or comfort that God will strengthen and uphold the righteous one with his right hand in Isaiah 41, 10. So the concept is linked to all three cases in the Old Testament, but it's also interesting to see that all three cases, they were told to not fear. So when Jesus is saying that he is the first and the last, he's speaking of his deity. So his first I am statement we see is I am the first and the last. The second is I am he that lives and was dead and behold, I am forever, forevermore, I'm alive. And Paul understood this, Romans chapter six and verse nine, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more death has no more dominion over him. Amen. And Jesus is saying, I'm he who lives. This is in the present tense. I'm he who lives. Jesus is alive, continually, perpetually living. And Paul knew that Christ had been resurrected and is now living. He's alive. Amen. Revelation 118 and the living one. I died. Right. In the Greek, it literally means that Jesus became dead. Christ is alive and he became dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. In the Greek, it means I'm alive unto the ages of the ages continually. That's what it, what it means to be alive. Then Father says this in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 40, for I lift up my hand to the heaven and say, I live forever. 
In the resurrection, Jesus Christ is alive unto the ages of the ages for all time. He is exalted as Lord and Christ forever. And then John says, Amen, so be it. It's a statement of fact. And then we got this and have the keys of hell and death. What do keys do? It grants the holder access to the contents of something, right? Something is locked up. If you don't have keys, you don't get in. Now, in the days of Christ, the wearing of large keys were a mark of a high status. The higher the exalted person was, the more keys that they had. They had the keys to everything. Joseph and Potiphar's house had all the keys to that house. Joseph had access to everything in that house. And Jesus is saying here, I have the keys of hell, which is Hades, and death. And the word Hades is the Greek version of the Hebrew shoal, which is the unseen realm. And Jesus Christ says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Listen to Psalms 68 and verse 20. He that is our God is the, is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belongs the issues from death. And in the Greek, it, the issues would be translated to something that went forth or the going out of. So it signifies an escape from death. What do we read in John chapter 5, 21 through 26? For as the Father raised up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens them whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my words and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come to any condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear, and those that hear shall live. For as the Father hath him, has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself. And also the reference to having the keys points to many passages which are, which is the entrance to death in Hades, as described being controlled by gates. Job 38, 17, Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? So those who are held behind these gates are described as prisoners. Isaiah 24, 22, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days they shall be visited. So it's Jesus now that has the ability and the power to lock or unlock these gates. He has the keys to give life. He has the keys to give death. What does Christ also say? John 14, 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes into the Father but by me. Okay. So it says, verse 19 and 20. Write therefore the things that you have seen, the things which are the, the things that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in your right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars and the angels and the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So it starts out with the word mystery and it means something that was formerly a secret but now is revealed. There are two mysteries being revealed here. One is the seven stars which we saw in his right hand which are the seven messengers to the seven churches. And the second one is the seven candlesticks, which are the seven churches. All right. Next week, we will start the first letter to the first church, the church of Ephesus. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you take the things that we have seen through your scripture and turn it into our hearts. Turn it to our hearts and allow it to burn into our hearts. Teach us to understand what we are, that, that we are, we are the light bearers of this world. Father, and that you are, as you as Christ, you are the center of that light. We pray that you allow us to always bear the light to this lost world, Father. If our fires have dwindled down, I ask that you relight our fires so that we would have more of a hunger and thirst for you. Teach us to have a reverential fear when we do anything that is unpleasing in your sight, Father, so that we would turn away and stop doing those things. We know you see all. So nothing is hidden from your sight. And we thank you for giving us everlasting life, an entrance from death unto life. 
And as we start this, this first letter to the Church of Ephesus, Father, we ask that you would allow us to see things that could possibly be in our own lives and that you could uh, take the words to help us line our lives up with what you would want us to do. As we read your words of life, Heavenly Father, and if anything was spoken out of context or from my flesh, cast it down, bring it to nothing, and only allow your words of truth to be remembered and to be driven in our heart. And we ask these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Keep the faith.